Okay, so if we're talking about whether ACL tears can heal, uh, I guess we've been saturated with this meta-narrative that they can't. And if you just type into Google, can ACL tears heal on their own? An ACL tear cannot heal on its own because there is no blood supply to the ligament. And so when I read that, I think, okay. And as a natural thinker, I just start thinking about that a little bit longer. I think, well, if there's no blood supply to it, how does it actually grow in the first place? Um, and then we hear this other stuff that it cannot heal on their own. And it's, it's this been this, this narrative that has pervaded. Um, when you trace back through where this idea came from, it comes back to this, this study where they actually resected the ligament in dogs and then they went back in again and looked and, and to see whether there had been any healing had taken place and there hadn't been. Um, none, of, none of the ACL tears had healed at all. Probably what they needed to do was apply, <laughs> was apply a wobble board or some strengthening program or put the dog into a brace. And this is where it's all fallen down is that as soon as the injury happens, we can't just leave the person. We have to try to stabilise it. It's a bit rough on the dogs for not having this done, but, but essentially to, in order to try to either work out is it the positioning of the brace or is it the mechanical stress that we're putting through the ligament, this is what um, should have been done and, and probably could be done both in animals and humans. So where did this all start for me? So how did I get to this point where I was starting to look into it? I had these two contrasting cases that I saw in pretty quick succession that Honestly, I was probably just minding my own business, not naturally someone who wants to talk more than I need to, but I had these two cases here in Perth. Uh, this first patient, she had an ACL reconstruction day one after the injury. Um, she had a, a contaminated hamstring graft which resulted in a LARS being performed. She then had a cyclops lesion removed arthroscopically. Then she had a synovectomy, a partial lateral meniscectomy. Uh, she then had a revision because it was felt that as her dial test was positive, um, and her, her graft was lax that she needed uh, that replaced and also a posterior lateral corner stabilisation. So she had that performed and so she was into her, um, she had five surgeries. She also had an infection along the way and then after, the day after her fifth surgery, her knee buckled and she tore her, her uh, MCL. And then I saw her walk into my, cl my clinic on a four-wheeled walker and so as someone who was in their mid-30s, it was a bit of a surprise to me. I was thinking, well, why is, she, why is this person... In the... And she was very despondent and um, actually is a bit of a sting in the tail. She's just torn her other ACL. So this was about uh, eight, years, uh, eight or nine years ago. And she's decided to, to choose a bracing strategy first. Uh, we did get her back, but it took about 18 months of, of solid rehab. So I saw that case. And then I had this other case who she came in and she was adamant that she didn't want surgery. She was just, I don't, I don't want surgery. My friends have had it. I don't want to do it. And so I looked into the research and I started thinking, okay, well, what does the studies show? And then I started to look into these, these meta studies and I said, okay, well, let's go through what your options are. We'll do a rehab program. So I did my rehab program, first one I've ever done. And then it was four and a half months she returned to play. And at long-term follow-up, she was fine and she returned to A-grade amateur field hockey. And so I started to look into the research and think, okay, well, this is, this is pretty cool. Like, this is something that we can definitely help patients with. So prior to COVID, I managed to fly over to Sweden and meet Professor Richard Froebel, uh, who was the lead author of the Canon study, and actually uh, Stefan Lomander, who was an uh, emeritus professor of orthopedics, who was Richard's supervisor for his PhD. And I sat down with both of these guys and I interviewed them for about two or three hours. And I just asked them every single question I could think of based on the comparative studies. And Stefan, interestingly, when I asked him, I said, look, Stefan, what do you tell patients? Because he's primarily a researcher, but he does do occasional surgeries. And he said, look, Kieran, it's a very different system here in Sweden. Look, the, the Richard Frobel is a, what we'd consider a specialist physio or an orthopedic non-surgeon. That's what they call them in Sweden. And he said, look, I tell patients to go away and do at least six months of rehab because I can't promise them if I operate on them early that they're going to have a better long-term outcome. And when he said that to me, I was like, okay, that's, that's pretty interesting. And then, so from that time, I just started to assess and treat patients and try to get the messages out there, make patients informed. And then a surgeon here in Perth started sending me ACL patients. I was thinking, this is pretty cool, asking for my opinion. And then I called him up and said, look, why are you sending me patients? And he goes, look, I believe in it. I believe this is something that can work. 
at the very least they need to do prehab. And he goes, how about we'll do an MRI? Because in our training, it's, we're, we're told that basically if we, if we don't operate, the patient's going to get additional meniscus tears due to ACL insufficiency. And so I just started doing repeat MRI in collaboration uh, with the surgeon and I started to see a large amounts of healing. So at least 50 to 60% would heal if we could catch the patients early enough to start stabilisation. So what have I seen? So I've seen uh, healing where it looks black and straight. I've seen where it's more curved. I've seen it thin and I've, not, I've seen it not heal at all. And so talking about it, <laughs> like talking about it like this, it might sound mind-blowing. Now it doesn't really surprise me. But again, it's, it's kind of like, is that ligament functional enough for the patient? Okay. Uh, so just going into pathophysiological considerations, there's been some recent research that highlights that this, the body will attempt to heal the ACL early, uh, particularly the proximal tears. The blood supply is better at the top and almost uh, double the middle and almost triple the distal. There was the, this Japanese study that they looked at uh, superb uh, microvascular imaging, which is like a high quality ultrasound. And they showed that actually straight away, the body will start to put more blood flow to the ligament. I guess the, the, the challenge is, has the synovial uh, envelope around the ligament stayed intact or not? And oftentimes it does. And so also with that, they've, they've done some uh, anatomical studies where they've got they've torn pa patients who haven't received any treatment. They've looked at their, the stumps under microscope and they've seen that actually you can get collagen that would predispose to someone having a potential bridge formation of a tear. And then there's this whole idea of mechanical transduction, which... Um, famous sports physician Karim Khan is very passionate about. And basically, once we, if the ligament is torn, once we start putting weight through it with a, from a strength and conditioning point of view, you can actually get additional collagen that can form between any cross fibers that have been built or if the ligament's close enough, they can, they, they, we can see uh, that the ligament can start to take its, its normal shape in a lot of cases. So... I guess an example of this you may have seen on social media where uh, there was a group of uh, female soccer players in the US who didn't have torn ACLs but they underwent a strength and conditioning program over a year. They then followed them up and they saw a significant increase in girth of their ligament over time. So this principle that we can actually build strength within muscle also can apply to ligament. So what about the current literature? So when I look at the literature, I'm obviously thinking, okay, well, what's most empirical? And there has been a systematic review that looks at the healing potential of an ACL. Again, if you can't find these, I'm happy to, to share these with you if you'd like. But basically, it was two Cypriot, and, and two Cypriot researchers and a, a Greek researcher. And they, they said, look, the ACL tears can heal at least 30, 35%. Um, but the quality of the studies is, is they're smaller. And, uh, but it's... I guess the key message for me is they started to look into the research and they said, well, if we shift the burden of proof for a moment and we go, okay, well, where is the research that says that ACL tears can't heal and there isn't any? And that's probably where it became a bit more dramatic for me. And they said, look, we would expect that there would be an abundance of evidence suggesting that this ligament can't heal. And certainly from a high quality point of view, there isn't any. So I kind of, I'm still waiting to see whether there will be any studies that come out. And I do think it's possible that we can, um, I guess, come up with some kind of collaboration where we can look and see what type of tears need what type of treatment. So, and I've, having started to talk about this, I've had all sorts of conversations and some people will say, look, it's never going to heal the same. There was some research uh, from the late 90s that showed that when you probe it, again, much like that IHARA paper from 96, that it does seem... T it, tense and the collagen does look what we would assume to be and feel like a ligament. Um, and then there's different types of bracing that can be applied. So this particular brace here is a, a jack brace. So this was a Swiss and US study, not dissimilar to the Japanese, uh, the Japanese one where they have this, uh, this force mechanism that basically does a posterior draw on the tibia. And uh, they then did a baseline MRI and then a follow-up MRI. 
And they also had a comparison arm in this study, so they had a rehab group. The, the ones that did heal, about 78% in the braced group, had a much better quality than the ones who didn't have a brace. So it, it, it's not to say that if you don't have a brace, it won't heal, but your quality is, is going to be less likely. Um, and so then there's, there's, there's a lot of papers, and for sake of time, I can't really go into all of them, but this is probably one of the ones I would use with patients. It's pretty straightforward, although the, the English uh, being... Um, English is as a second language with the authors. It's probably, you can sort of see what they're, what, when you've read it at least once or twice, uh, what they do. So they actually had an unrestricted hinge knee brace. And their idea is that if you keep it in a, the patient basically in those first three months in a uniplanar direction and don't get them to twist too much, uh, you can get quite high chances of healing. So they had 83 out of 102 heal. Um, and the way they defined it, so they would... Obviously, you do the baseline MRI and then you do a follow-up MRI at three months, okay? And so, they would describe uh, the first tear in these kind of main four categories. So, you have a straight and continuous band, okay? Uh, they had a, essentially 100% of healing on follow-up MRI. So, if, it's, if the tear is, is, when it first happens, if it's minimally torn, but it's still what we would classify as a grade three rupture, uh, that's a very high chance. If, it, if there's a degree of curvature to it, 95% chance of at least getting some healing, but still predominantly normal. If it's displaced, 75% of some healing, but it's only about 20% that will look normal on follow-up MRI. And then if it's disrupted, horizontally orientated or unclear, like the ACL basically just looks completely munted on the first MRI, then it's none of them will look normal on follow-up MRI, but there will be some attempt at healing, whether it be curved or it'll attach to the PCL. Or, but because these patients were braced early and they had the strength, they suggested, well, look, we have to conclude that the ACL can have a high healing capacity. Um, so here's a case of a flip bundle. So, uh, and we've seen this in the CROSS protocol and I've seen this personally where the patients do have a forward displaced ligament um, confirmed on MRI two days. They then do a follow-up MRI and it had migrated back. And then they do a six months and it's uh, looking almost normal and then 12 months uh, and then three years. So there's different, there's going to be some new research coming out that suggests that we can actually uh, grade these tears early. So be on the lookout for that. But at the, in terms of the degree of displacement and how retracted it is and I guess the idea would be that if we can use AI even and kind of predict how this tear looks, what type of treatment strategy we do, whether it be ACL repair, whether it be RICO, whether it be a brace strategy, whether it be strengthening, what are we going to do with these types of tears and, and can we make it more heterogeneous? So uh, currently the classification would be it looks normal, it looks thickened, it looks thin or it's completely absent. Okay. Um, and I guess it was serendipitous that I ended up meeting Richard Frobel and, and Lomander from the Canon study because they've done an additional research into the Canon and they've seen that of the patients who didn't uh, choose surgery eventually, 60% of them healed. So this was with no brace at all uh, in a randomized control trial. Uh, there was evidence of healing and not only was there evidence of healing, but the, those who healed were better than the reconstructed and the ones who didn't heal. So in an ideal world, we would want to get patients' ACLs to heal naturally. And then it leads to the CROSS paper where uh, this is, I guess, taking off and there's been mixed reactions to it and uh, it's certainly burgeoning in terms of the, the patients that are being included within it. So there's now at least 500 subjects that have gone through with what we would consider a 90% healing rate. And this doesn't include uh, non-anatomical healing and a significant proportion, like I was saying earlier, of the meniscus tears do become asymptomatic over time. And the, fair enough, you'd think, well, is it going to actually be similar to their original ACL? The, uh, the re-tear re rates are similar to reconstruction. And even the lower grade healing, so if it looks more, even if it looks slightly more sagged uh, or if it attaches to the PCL, it's, it's similar outcomes in terms of...